This is Speak Up. I am Sandra Schulte. Welcome back to our show. Today, I'm thrilled to have Ronald Grelsimer come back to our show to talk about a patient's guide to unnecessary knee surgery. Very important. Very important. Ronald is a New York orthopedic surgeon of how many years? Uh, going back to 1985. He is the author of a must-have, and I cannot say this strongly enough, book called What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Knee Surgery. Now, why is this book important? It will definitely help you to understand your knee condition. You will be able to ask cogent questions. You'll be able to make more informed decisions. Ron, some people say all orthopedists always recommend surgery. Why might they say this? Well, they might say that because sometimes it's actually true. Uh, you, there's a saying, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And while most uh, doctors and most orthopedic surgeons are perfectly honest and have your best interests at heart, uh, there is that minority um, feeling that if you have uh, knee pain, then it's worth uh, taking a look inside the knee to see what might be wrong. What is an LKSS person, injury attorney, and his associated orthopedist? So LKSS is a term that I coined, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. LK dash SS. So LK stands for limited knowledge, and SS stands for suspect scruples. So sometimes a patient uh, you might get uh, bad advice from a healthcare professional. It doesn't have to be an orthopedic surgeon. It could be a rehab doctor. It could be a chiropractor. It could be could be you know anybody who deals with knees. Um, you might get bad advice because the person just doesn't know any better. It's not their particular specialty, and they think they're giving you good advice. But they're not. So that's just a question of, of knowledge. They're well-meaning. And then you have people who know they're giving you bad advice, but they do so anyway. They see dollar signs. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I diplomatically call suspect scruples. Let's talk about diagnosis. Diagnosis, OK. What is a thorough physical examination? What is a thorough? Physical examination, it's an examination that's appropriate to whatever your complaints are. And what I mean by that is there's a long list of questions you can ask a person, and there's a long list of tests that you can perform on someone with knee pain, starting from the spine going all the way down to the foot. But you're not going to ask every possible question and perform every possible test on every personal person who comes in with knee pain. So part of being an orthopedic surgeon is knowing what questions to ask and what should be tested on the physical examination. Unfortunately, what I found in my experience is that x-rays and especially MRIs have supplanted the asking of questions and the examination. So the patient gets a cursory exam and then is sent off for an MRI. Just for curiosity's sake, the uh, repayment by uh, Medicare, uh, the limited repayment of payment for the surgeon's time per a, a problem, does that play any role in it, maybe? Yeah, finances play a role in every decision-making, consciously or unconsciously. Um, I like to think that the more honest doctors put that off to the side, um, but it's always, it's always lurking there. I mean, if you're getting paid uh, less and less to do the same amount of work, then you're just going to try to increase the amount of work so that at the end of the day, you've still managed to have the same income. So that is an unfortunate byproduct of our, of our current system. Should the orthopedist confirm his diagnosis with the X-ray? So making a diagnosis has multiple parts. First, there's the history. What is the person telling you? Uh, 
How old are they? What are their medical conditions? If it's pain, when did it start? When do they get the pain? What makes it worse? What makes it better? And so forth. And then there is the physical examination, the hands-on portion. And then you have basic x-rays, which is another lost art in the world of needs. We can discuss that. And then you have the MRI. Uh, and then you have the arthroscopy that lets the doctor look inside the knee with a very fine instrument and take pictures. So there are multiple steps, but if the surgeon, the orthopedist, goes through all those steps carefully, there is very often no need for the MRI or the arthroscopy. But that, unfortunately, gets bypassed. The, and doctor, doctors are very quick to get the MRI. In fact, I have patients come to me, they haven't seen an orthopedist. They have knee pain and they've seen their primary care doctor. And the primary care doctor thinks that he or she is gonna help out the orthopedist by already ordering the MRI. So the person comes with their MRI, but it's useless because they have bad arthritis and the bad arthritis shows up on the X-ray. I don't need an MRI to tell me that this person has bad arthritis. That was a waste of whatever the insurance company pays for an MRI these days. And what's worse is the MRI can be very misleading. So let's say somebody has bad arthritis. Now they get an MRI. What is the MRI going to say? 100% chance, well, nothing's 100%. 99% chance that in addition to the arthritis, the radiologist is going to say there's a torn meniscus. Now, the meniscus is the rubbery shock absorber here uh, that's between the bones, between the, the shin bone and the thigh bone. You have rubbery menisci, one on each side. So when the MRI says, or the radiologist says that there's a torn meniscus, that opens the door to the recommendation for a little outpatient clean-out arthroscopy to address that nasty meniscal tear. Of course, that meniscal tear is really not the problem. The problem is that the, the knee is completely worn down. That's the problem. So the odds of this little cleanup working is, generally speaking, very, very low. So it's really a waste of everybody's time. Not, it's not a waste of the surgeon's time, but it's a waste of the patient's time to undergo this procedure. Now, there are exceptions. Now, if you have a very large tear of a meniscus and only a little area of arthritis, that would be an exception. But most of the time, it's just a degenerated meniscus in a worn out knee. And more likely in older people, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, the, the older you are, the more likely you'd, you are to have some wear and tear of your meniscus, which you know, is gonna show up on the MRI as a torn meniscus. And it would seem to me also, if you've already had knee surgery, and maybe even a meniscus surgery, you're more likely, because it's an injury, have arthritis. Well, is that true? Yes and no. If you um, if you have a torn meniscus, then that part of the meniscus that's torn is not functioning. Mm -hmm. The meniscus is meant to be a shock absorber. It's meant to be a lubricant. It's meant to help stabilize the knee. And if the meniscus is torn, yes then it's not doing those things. So going in and removing that little portion that's torn, in and of itself, is not going to cause arthritis. If you were going to get arthritis, it's because the meniscus was torn to begin with. But again, the, in order for a meniscus to be torn and cause arthritis, it would have to be a very significant piece. Most torn menisci are nothing but a little cuticle that's blown up by the arthroscopy picture. I see. But it's a little cuticle, and that in itself is never gonna cause arthritis. What is the value of ordering the various views? On the x-ray, yes. the various views. So uh, the most basic views uh, are the front and side views. Front, side. If you go to the emergency room and you have knee pain, that's the x-ray they're gonna get. They may get, maybe, will get a kneecap view, which looks like this. 
the, the x-ray beam comes down and looks at the kneecap. Because in an emergency room, they're looking to see if you have a fracture. That's their goal. But there are other views to be had that will pick up arthritis or a kneecap that's not well positioned. So those include x-rays done with the person standing up. It includes x-rays done with the person standing up and their knee bent, 45 degrees. And it, and it includes a formal view that I was just referring to where you can see the kneecap and you can see if it's too far to the right or to the left. So those are x-rays anybody should have if they're old enough to have arthritis. And even teenagers should have those, but without the necessarily without standing. Should the orthopedist confirm his diagnosis with the x-ray? Well, when you're making a diagnosis, it's like putting a puzzle together. And ideally, all the, pu all the pieces of the, puzzles, of the puzzle create a picture. So the history is, part of, is one piece of the puzzle. The exam is another piece of the puzzle. Um, in some cases, blood tests are part another piece of the puzzle. And yes, and the x-rays are part of the puzzle. And if an MRI is obtained, that's another piece. And there are other tests. There are bone scans, CAT scans. These are all pictures, pieces of puzzle. And so the doctor uses as many as he or she needs to, and for the picture to come up. And sometimes the history and the examination are the only two pieces of the puzzle that you need. And other times, you need five or six pieces before you start to see the picture. And of, and of course, there's, there's the problem of the uh, orthopedist being able to read these x-rays properly, I guess. Right. And that, OK, so the question is, should x-rays be read also by the orthopedic surgeon who ordered the test? And the answer is yes, because the orthopedic surgeon might read the x-rays differently from the way the radiologist wrote, uh, read them. It's even more of an issue with an MRI because the x-ray is quick to read and can be done in the presence of the patient right there, whereas an MRI takes time to go through carefully. And that's not typically done with the patient right there in the room unless the doctor has already reviewed the MRI and already knows of the 100 pictures which six are the ones to show the patient. Um, but a disappointing number of orthopedists do not read the MRIs themselves. Um, they just rely on the report. So if the radiologist says there's a torn meniscus, that's all the orthopedist needs to hear because that justifies doing the surgery. Um, but there's a lot of information that the orthopedist can gain from looking at the pictures themselves. Radiologists, for example, uh, are in America are not always keen on recognizing kneecap disorders. Uh, it's gotten better over the last 20 years, but it's still a problem. So if the radiologist doesn't pick up that there's a kneecap issue and the orthopedist doesn't look at the MRI, then the diagnosis is missed. And that I see not uncommonly, actually. So um, it is important for doctors to look at their, uh, at the MRI. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. If, uh, if a person has a, a fracture and the radiologist says, Dr. Jones, I have your patient here. She has such and such fracture of the wrist, the doctor can assume that the person has a, a wrist fracture. So a doctor doesn't always have to uh, second guess the radiologist. But as a basic rule, it's a good idea for the doctors to look at the films themselves. One person might miss something. Another person will be looking at it from a different angle and see something the other person missed? Listen, I once saw a patient who came to me um, for a second opinion regarding surgery on the ACL, mm -hmm. ligament inside the knee that's not uncommonly torn in sports. Um, and the only reason he came to me is because the, other, the first doctor didn't accept his insurance. Uh, otherwise, if it hadn't been for that, he would have signed up to have his ACL taken out. But when I listened to the story, um, it didn't sound like an ACL. There hadn't even been any trauma. The guy had just developed knee pain. And then on the exam, the knee was very stable. And then when I looked at the MRI, well, the, the ACL looked fine. So I 
I actually called the radiologist. I said, listen, what's going on here? And the radiologist said, oops, I think that might have been for another patient. Okay, well, you know, we all make mistakes. That's right. But the point here is the first guy hadn't looked at the MRI and noticed that the ACL was fine. He just went by the report, and he didn't pay much attention to the fact that there had been no trauma. And I guess he had talked to himself into thinking that the exam wasn't 100% normal. And so, you know, that's how errors get made. So you need a kind of a checks and balances why are some conditions overread? Some conditions are overread because um, uh, radiologists and orthopedists and healthcare professionals are given the right to call any little change in the meniscus a tear. So that would be like someone missing a couple of hairs on their head and being called partially bald. Well, that would be true but not realistic. Or imagine a beautiful sunny day, a perfect bluebird blue day with a little white cloud in the sky. Now, a weatherman could say, partly cloudy with a chance of rain. And we would all think that's ridiculous. You know, a weatherman wouldn't last very long in that job if every time there was a little cloud, it was partly cloudy with a chance of rain. But in the radiology world, the orthopedic world, that's allowed. So every time there's a little bit of so-called signal change, that becomes a potential tear. The meniscus on an MRI is solid black, like coal, like the microphone stand. And when there's a little bit of white in it, the radiologist will sometimes call that a tear. Now, Tears are graded one, two, and three. And a grade one tear is just a little insignificant bit of white. But very often the radiologists do not say that it's a grade one tear. They'll say there's a tear. And when they do say a grade one tear, the orthopedist may not communicate that to the patient, that it's just a grade one tear and then forget about it. Yes. They'll say, oh, there's a tear. We should go in and take a look mm. before it gets worse. Yes. What are some conditions that do not show up? There are a number of knee conditions that will not show up on an MRI, which is another problem uh, with getting an MRI without getting an adequate history or physical examination. So one thing a knee MRI will not pick up is something going on in the hip. So if your knee pain is coming from something in the hip, the MRI is not going to pick it up. Uh, and that's more common in children than in adults but um, not unheard of at all, so that's one. Number two, if you have tightness of a muscle uh, or of a tendon, like your iliotibial band along the outside of your thigh, the knee MRI is not going to pick that up. And yet tightness of the iliotibial band is a potential source of pain. That requires the person to be placed on their side during the examination and there's a certain test for the iliotibial band. Um, if you have some irritation of a fine nerve under the skin, say you fall on the ground and your knee hits the ground, uh, you're in a car, the knee hits the dashboard, any kind of blunt trauma to the front of the knee can irritate the fine nerves under the skin, which can be painful, easy to treat, but can be painful, can linger, not gonna show up on an MRI. So if the, that person goes for an MRI, They'll be told they have a torn meniscus. Then, as a result of that, they will be told they have an arthroscopy. And of course, the sensitive skin will remain. That will still not have been treated. When are sudden meniscus tears potentially a problem? A sudden meniscal tear is a problem um, when the tear is so large that a person has persistent pain and clunking. Um, Again, most meniscal tears that you see on an MRI or on an arthroscopy picture are just little cuticles. But when it's big enough to be a hangnail, that, that can be painful. Just like if you have a hangnail and you put your hand in a glove, that hurts. So uh, 
there are people with significant meniscal tears, and they do get better with an arthroscopy and a partial meniscectomy. Urgent arthritis surgery. That's the title of one of the chapters, and I'm being somewhat sarcastic because there <laughs> is no urgent arthritis surgery. Um, when you have arthritis and you have a flare-up, it can be very painful. And uh, some doctors might take advantage of that pain to sign people up for surgery because these people are really in a lot of pain. But arthritis surgery also typically uh, waxes and wanes. So whether or not you're taking this medication or that medication or using that injection or that brace, after a while, the pain quiets down. Clearly, some people get that severe pain s with such frequency that they do need surgery. I mean, s knee surgery is a, can be a tremendous benefit, uh, and thousands of people have benefited from it. So not for me to say that knee surgery is not a good thing. It can be a terrific thing. You just have to pick your patients correctly. When should one use an MRI or an X-ray? So you start with an X-ray, and you, get, you make sure you get a good set of X-rays. Again, um, to reiterate the point, not everybody with knee pain needs an MRI. If you get a good set of X-rays, the diagnosis may be apparent, and then you don't need the MRI. Now, if... Um, there's a suspicion of a ligament injury, which is not going to show up on an x-ray, but the history and the exam are consistent with the ligament injury, and the person may need surgery. That's a good indication for an MRI. What part of the knee gives the most frequent knee pain? Well, there are three parts to the knee. It's like an apartment with three rooms. So on this model, you have the medial compartment, which is the inner compartment, and then you have the outside compartment, and then you have the kneecap compartment over here in the front. And they can all three give you pain. Now, I don't know that one predominates. If I had to pick one, I would say the inside one. So the left side of your right knee, or the right side of your left knee, would be the most common. The interior side. The interior, yeah, medial, technically. Now, Dr. G. I'd like to call you Dr. G. All righty. You have a 10-step treatment plan, or we can call it triage after a knee joint injury. What are the most important elements? Well, the good news is there, if you have arthritis, if you have knee arthritis, there are many things you can do. Nothing works on everybody. So if you go to a cocktail party and somebody says, I tried this, and it was great, it doesn't mean it's going to be great for you. So you try this and you try that. And you usually start with the lower end and work your way up. So, for example, you'll start with uh, acetaminophen. The most common brand for that is Tylenol. Uh, you can take the generic. There are anti-inflammatories that you can take if your doctor says it's okay. Uh, that includes ibuprofen, naproxen, um, there are basic injections, steroid injections, uh, that can be beneficial. They don't cure the problem, but they manage the problem. Then there are more sophisticated types of injections, the visco supplementation. Um, uh, weight loss, if a person is overweight. A person sees, uh, your knee sees up to five times, if not more, your body weight. So if you put on a pound, your knee thinks you put on five pounds, and vice versa. So weight control is probably the one thing that people can most um, control when it comes to their knee pain. Words that do not mean and that anything is wrong with you. Okay. Um, there are a few words that I consider to be orthopedic double talk because they sound very knowledgeable but they simply translate to the doctor saying he or she doesn't exactly know what's wrong. So in the knee, they might say you have chondromalacia. And that term has given way to you have patellofemoral syndrome, which is a real mouthful. 
Um, these are not diagnoses. There are insurance codes, but they're not diagnoses. If the doctor's telling you that's what you have, he or she hasn't really quite figured out what the source of your pain is. So you should be aware of that. What is the best way to find a good doctor? There's no ideal way because people who give you advice on what doctor to see may themselves not be completely in the know, like even your primary care physician may not know who the best knee guy or the best shoulder guy or the back spine guy is. And then other people may have a bit of a vested interest. So if you call a hospital, well, guess what? They're going to give you the name of somebody on their staff. Meanwhile, the best guy for your condition might be at the hospital down the street. Um, now, if you're going on the Internet looking for names, well, then it's just playing roulette. Um, so at the end of the day, I think if you have a consultation with an orthopedist, you might say, well, I've been given the name of these three people. Is there, are there any of these that I really shouldn't see? You know, then you might start to get close. Because that orthopedist also has vested interests. He's not going to send you to the competition, even though the competition might be perfect for you. So you just have to keep in mind where people are coming from. What is the, should be a best takeaway for this show? Don't believe everything you hear immediately. Uh, you have to make sure the doctor's paid attention to you. Uh, that if he's ordered or she's ordered tests, that he or she has reviewed them, uh, him or herself, uh, and that they've, uh, somebody has taken the time with you to examine you and to listen to your history. I want to thank you so much for coming on our show. This is Speak Up. I am Sandra Schulte. Until next time, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.